Okay, welcome back from the break. <coughs> welcome back from the break. Um, so our next speaker of the day is going to be um, Dr. Lauren Hayward. Um, she is from the Perimeter Institute in Canada. How many of you have heard of the Perimeter Institute? I think she'll be telling okay. us a bit more about that. So Lauren got her PhD in physics in 2017 from University of Waterloo, and now she is a PSI fellow. So PSI is a international um, very competitive master's program where Lauren is now a, a, does teaching, and she does research as well, and has um, papers in uh, science and in PRL. And she's going to be telling us about um, understanding how machines understand. Great, thank you. Okay, guys, so if you didn't see this already, I'm just hoping this is going to be pretty interactive today. And maybe I can give you a few exercises throughout that you might be able to use in your classroom. So um, if you don't have a pen and paper, we have some extras on the piano here. We won't need it for a few minutes. Um, and if you have a laptop, it would be great if you can take it out. But if you don't, actually, your cell phone will work fine. So you can actually are encouraged to use phones at some point. <laughs> uh, and it would be great. I think most of you are sitting within discussion distance of at least one other person, because I kind of want you to discuss some problems today, too. Uh, so here's the title of my talk. It's a little bit different than what's in your program. So uh, the title is Understanding How Artificial Neural Networks Understand. So we're kind of trying to understand how artificial intelligence works in this talk. Um, so as Miles said, I'm from Canada. Is anyone else here from Canada, by the way? Or has one person? OK, great. Um, so I was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, kind of in the center of Canada. <laughs> yeah. You did? Oh, great. That's awesome. Someone from? With the promise that I would never have to step foot in Winnipeg. Oh, I see you. <laughs> Okay, so from a distance. Oh, okay. Doesn't count. <laughs> cool. So um, I grew up in Winnipeg. I did my bachelor's degree there. Then I moved to Waterloo, and I did my graduate studies there. And now I work at the Perimeter Institute as a teacher in the master's program, as Miles said, and a researcher. Um, so Canada this time of year, I think it's actually very beautiful. Looks like this, something like this. I think it's really nice, actually. Um, but I do have to say right now we're having really bad weather there. There's been some really bad ice storms, a lot of snow, freezing rain. So I'm very happy to be here with all of you. <laughs> OK, so before I start telling you about machine learning and neural networks, I want to ask you guys what you already know about it. So I know you've all heard the term machine learning because it's in the title of this conference. And Kiran gave a nice talk already. So you just maybe shout out some words that come to mind when you hear about machine learning. Just anything at all. The major. The matrix. Okay. What was it, Sagan? They're taking over. They're taking over. Okay. Anything maybe less scary, like something more <laughs> optimistic? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. 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 Yeah. Algorithms. Algorithms. Awesome. Yeah. So I think that's definitely one thing that, like, if you think about what tools that you need to do it, people often think about algorithms or computer programming, right? So if you think about you know, what courses you would need to take in high school to maybe have a career doing something in machine learning. I think for a lot of people, the first thing that would come to mind would be something to do with algorithms or machine learning, or uh, uh, programming or algorithms, yeah. Anything else? Artificial intelligence. Awesome, yeah, that's a really good one, yeah. Uh, deep layers of uh, processing. Awesome, yeah, that's really good. So deep learning, artificial intelligence, really good, yeah. Anything? Pattern recognition. Pattern, yeah, that's a great one, yeah. Anything else? What were you, you were I was going to say modeling. Modeling, yeah, very good, yeah. Anything else? Okay, cool. So I, I just put a list of a few things I thought you might say, and I think you guys did say a lot of these things. So artificial intelligence, definitely something that would come to mind. As we talked about computer science in terms of a tool or a class that you might need to take. Neural networks, that was the title of my talk, so I, I know you guys have heard that term before. And then some of you did say deep learning. Um, but two things that I... I was right when I predicted you wouldn't say, are linear algebra and calculus. So um, these are actually tools that students might see in high school. And it turns out they're really important for studying machine learning. Um, so it's not true that math isn't important for your future. This is a case you're going to see where you know sometimes people say, what am I ever going to use this for when they learn this in school? Well, here you're going to see this is an application where it's really important to understand linear algebra and calculus in order to understand how machine learning works. OK, now we heard about, I've said the words artificial intelligence, machine learning, and neural networks. But 
I wanted to kind of take a second to talk about the difference between these three things. So it turns out that neural networks, which is what I'm going to talk about today, they're actually a subset of machine learning, and machine learning itself is a subset of methods from artificial intelligence. So when someone says artificial intelligence, what it really means is any type of computer that can in some way mimic intelligent human behavior, whereas machine learning has some aspect of these computers um, having some element of learning. So without being explicitly given rules to something, they have some way of figuring it out. And that's going to become more clear throughout this talk. And artificial neural networks, this is a specific type of machine learning architecture that's actually inspired by the neurons in our brains. And this is exactly what I'm going to focus on in this talk. So I hope by the end of this talk, you'll be able to give a short description of what these are. Okay, so <clears throat> first I wanted to take some pictures of neural networks just from research papers. So these are research papers from the past few years that have figures, and I've just directly taken the figures from these papers, of neural networks. So there's one, there's another one. This one looks a bit more three-dimensional than the others. And here's another one, looks pretty complicated. This one has some cubes and some, a lot of different symbols in it too. Um, <clears throat> And I should mention that these two figures here are actually taken by, um, from papers by Giacomo Torlai, who is one of the speakers for this afternoon. Um, so these networks are all a little bit different, as you can tell just looking at them. They don't all look exactly the same. But they do have some common features, right? They all have lines connecting different layers, as we said. Someone mentioned that machine learning makes them think of layers. So you can kind of see different layers here. Um, a lot of them have circles or squares or cubes that connect different things. Um, and so these networks are all different. They all do different things. But actually, in part, the reason that they're different is because people just like to draw things in their own special way with their own conventions. So some of these networks are actually maybe more similar than they seem, but people just like to use different symbols and conventions when they draw them. OK, so neural networks can be used for many different purposes. And you're going to see, I think this afternoon, a lot of different applications. But I just want to start by talking about one possible class of applications, and that's for classifying images. So the idea would be we have some computer that's designed to do the task of classifying. So I would put in an image as input to this computer. And as output, it would give me some kind of a description of this image. So it would tell me some feature of this image, something that I might want to know about it. And if I want to think of this more mathematically, I can just think that I take some input, I'll call it x, some x. I feed that into some function that I'll call f. And from there, I get an output, y, which comes from applying that function f to x. That's really just two kind of different ways of thinking about the same idea here. So let's think of an example. Um, so I think Kieran actually said this example seems a lot less useful than what he talked about in his talk. But uh, it's a simple way to kind of get the idea, at least. So, um, let's imagine we wanted to have a machine that could just take in a picture and tell us whether it contains a bird or whether it contains a dog. So for example, if I take this picture that I actually took, I took this picture just the other day here in Santa Barbara. <laughs> if I uh, fed that picture into this computer that I've designed, maybe I would get a zero. Whereas if I put in this picture of my dog playing in the snow, I would get a one. So what this, what this machine would ideally do is it would give me a 0 if I have a bird, and it would give me a 1 if I have a dog. And it shouldn't matter what that dog looks like. So this is a completely different dog. This one's inside. It looks very different. I should still get a 1, even though these pictures look very different. OK, but this machine that I've designed here, all it knows how to do is recognize birds and dogs. So what do you think would happen if I put in a picture of a squirrel, for example, or just some other picture that's not a bird or a dog? Anyone have a guess? What might happen? I'm hearing a lot of things. Some people, I think, said zero. Anything else? No. 0.5, yeah, cool. That's a really great guess, yeah. No, that's really awesome, actually, because you're absolutely right. It would, it would actually depend on how we trained this machine and what it was designed to do and, ex and the actual details. But I think that's a really great interpretation that in a lot of cases, we might get something between 0 and 1. So it's not for sure a dog. It's not for sure a bird. But 
Maybe because a squirrel has fur, I don't know, maybe it looks a little bit more like a dog. Depends what you think, I don't know. I thought maybe it looks a little bit more like a dog than a bird, so maybe it, we would get 0.6. Again, it would depend on the exact machine that we're using, but this is something plausible we might have. Okay, now I wanted to give you guys an example that we could actually study today by hand and with code really quickly, and, in, uh, and these images have lots and lots of pixels. So I actually want to talk about an example that's even simpler than that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to consider another example of classifying images, but these images are just going to be really simple three by three images. And we want our, com our computer to tell us just whether or not they contain a rectangle. So this one here, it does contain a rectangle with width one, height two. So if I put that in, I'll get a one. Whereas if I put another configuration, it doesn't have a rectangle there. Um, so I'd get zero. So what would I get if I put this in? Just to make sure. How many people think I would get zero? How many people think I would get one? Okay, most people think one. Yeah, so indeed we should get one because a square is a type of rectangle, right? It's another subset thing, yeah? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we should ideally get one here. Yeah, okay. Um, what about here? What do you think I would get here if I feed this in? How many people would say zero? How many people would say one? Okay, I think most people are saying one in that case. But So again, it would really depend on the details of my computer here. But here I specifically said I want to classify whether it contains one rectangle. So in this case, I would get zero for this input. But again, you could design another example for which the output here would be one. But for the example we're going to consider today, we're just going to choose to define this as zero. But you're, you kind of have to decide what you're trying to classify in this type of problem. Okay, so this is the neural network that we're going to use today. And as we saw a few slides back, depending what you're trying to do and all these different papers you can read, neural networks can look very different. Um, but this is the one that we're going to use today. And the idea is that information goes from left to right here. So on the left, I'm going to have my input. And then I'm going to apply some function to it. And then out is going to come some output. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about exactly how to apply this function. But let's just start by understanding the input, actually, in this case. So the first thing we need to do is put some input in there. Um, so it turns out this input is actually just going to be uh, a series of numbers. So our first, the first square here is going to contain a number. I'm going to call that x1. And then in this case, it's going to go all the way up to x9. And these numbers, in the case that we're looking at today, are just going to be zeros or ones. So this is just one example. Maybe my x1 is 0, x2 is 1, et cetera. Um, then the way that I'm actually going to store this on a computer, and we're going to see this when we look at code in a little while, is I'm just going to store this in a list, or we might call this a vector, too. Um, so this list just contains each element. So the first element is 0, the second element is 1, and et cetera. You can see it matches up what I have here. Okay, but I told you before that the example we're going to look at is this rectangle example, so our input looks something like this. But I want to get something out that's this list of numbers. So do you guys have ideas how I might translate this input into a row? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So exactly right. So what we would choose to do is we would choose to label our sites in some order. So maybe I'm going to say this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, et cetera. Um, and then I'm going to say that every time I have a white square, it's 0. Every time I have a black one, it's 1. So in this case, the, if I had this image, the input I would put in here is this one. So three zeros and then 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. OK, so just to make sure this is clear, I want to ask you guys now um, just to check. Uh, so how would I translate this one into an input? So if you want, you can discuss for a second with the person next to you, and then I'll kind of poll you guys, and I'll ask you what the answer is. Okay, guys, so maybe 
I'll get you to come back here. Bring your attention back here. Awesome. So I'm glad to hear you guys talking. So I'm going to just poll you guys. So how many of you thought the answer was A, B, C, D, D, D? Oh, you're in. Yeah, I, thought, I realized maybe I was going too fast. Sorry. <laughs> and D? Okay, awesome. Great. Yeah, so exactly. I, I even put a hint here, but you guys didn't need it. So the answer is D. Perfect. So I'm glad this is clear up to here. Awesome. So now um, we understand the first part of these networks, which is the input. Um, so now I just want to introduce a bit of terminology. So as I said, these structures are actually inspired by the brain, where we have neurons and synapses sending signals. Um, so we're, what we're going to call each of these squares and circles, we're going to call them neurons. And the input I've drawn as squares, and all the other neurons are circles here. Um, and so I'm going to give labels here. So I'm going to say that my layer 0, I'm going to call that, z uh, sorry, my first layer here, the input layer, that's going to be 0. The next layer I'll call layer 1, and then layer 2. And each of them have a different number of neurons, as you can see. So the first layer has 9 neurons, because I have 9 input pixels in my images. The next layer is going to have 2, and the last one's going to have 1. But I really want to emphasize here that this is just one possible neural network. So even for this example, I could have chosen to put more neurons in my layer, for example. I, even, I could have chosen to have more layers. That would have been making my network more deep. Um, and in some applications that you'll look at, there's not even just one output. You might have examples where your network is going to give you more than one output. There might be more than one thing you want to learn about that image. Um, but today, we're just going to look at this simple example where um, we're just learning one thing, this 0 or 1, rectangle or not. OK, so as I said, we want to give labels to these neurons. So L is going to tell us what label we're in. So all of these have L equals 0, L equals 1, L equals 2. And then we're going to introduce a second label, I, that's just going to label each neuron within the layer. So here goes I equals from 1 all the way to 9, 1, 2, and then here just 1. And just one more variable name that we need to know is A. So A is going to be the output from each neuron. So if I'm in label, layer L and I'm looking at neuron I, the output from that neuron should be I. So let's just start by thinking of one of these neurons in the first layer. So let's go, I'm going to show you in a lot of detail, I think, um, how we could calculate the output from this neuron. Okay, so the formula that we're going to use in order to calculate this output is given here, and we're going to go through this step by step. Um, so what we need to do is we need to take in the output from the previous layer, which in this case is just the input. So the output from our previous layer is all the things in layer 0. So all of these nine things that are going to just be from my image that I put in. And then I need to multiply those numbers by some numbers that are w, which I call weights, and some other numbers called biases. I'm going to add those. And then after I've done all of that, I'm going to apply some function g which I write here. This specific g here is called a sigmoid function, but I can apply lots of other functions, and this is actually just a choice for what I'm choosing to show you today. But in lots of different applications, they'll try various functions. And these weights and biases, I'm going to show you on the next slide what they are for one example, and then we're going to talk later about how we find what they have to be. And here is the first place where we see linear algebra in this talk. So, Basically, calculating what's inside of this function involves multiplying some vectors and some matrices. Um, so there you can see right here, right from the very beginning, um, as soon as we start talking about how to process information in neural networks, it's important to use some linear algebra. OK, so let's talk about a specific example. So um, let's say that I want to put in as input to my network this vector x which, um, as we've gone through, we know how to translate this into this list of numbers here. Uh, this is just from, as on the previous slide, this is the neuron that I'm trying to look at, layer 1, neuron 1, which means L is 1, I is 1. And let's say that these are the weights and biases that I want to consider here. And then just to remind you, these are the formulas from the previous slide. I know this is a lot of formulas on one slide, but it's pretty important to be able to see everything at once. So. Hopefully you can see it from the back of the room. So this is just from the previous slide. This is just how we calculate the output from a given neuron. OK, so to start out with, 
um, let's start by calculating this sum here. That's the first thing we need in order to calculate this output. And as I said here, we're looking at layer 1, neuron 1. That means that in this formula, L is going to be equal to 1, and I is going to be equal to 1 as well. So here, that's why I have a 0, a 1, and a 1 here. That just corresponds to which neuron I'm looking at. So if I want to calculate this sum, basically what I need to do is I need to look at the elements here, and I need to look at this column of my weight matrix. And I need to multiply this 0 by this element here, this next one by this one, and etc. And this actually is pretty easy in this example, just because I have so many zeros in this input. And of course, if I multiply 0 by anything, I still get 0. So the only times I really need to worry is when I have a 1 somewhere here. So you can see I, the 1 picks up this minus 3.8, this 1 picks up the minus 0.3. So the result of this sum is just negative 4.1 in this case. Then the next thing I need to do is I need to add in this bias. And again, I've put in the right labels here. So what this really means is I need to add this result here with the bias here stored in this matrix. And when I do that, I get minus 4.4. Okay, so just one more step to go. The last thing I need to do is I need to calculate the G function applied to all of this. So that means applying G to this whole thing here, so that means I need to calculate g of negative 4.4. And when I do that, I just get 0.012. Does anyone have questions about the idea of how this works? Yeah? Where did the weights and bias numbers come from? Yeah, that's, that's something that I was trying to leave for the end of the talk, but it's great that you're asking now. So, <laughs> so um, these weights and biases are really what defines our network. So this is really what tells us how good this network is at identifying rectangles. So what we usually do is we start from something random, and then we have a smart way of figuring out how to change it as time goes on. So that's really the learning part. The learning part of this algorithm is figuring out what these numbers need to be in here. And I'm going to tell you later at the end of the talk how we actually do that. But I'm going to postpone the full answer to a little bit later, if that's OK. Yeah? Um, why are there two values of the reason is because in, if I go back to here, it's because there's two neurons in this layer. So that, um, it's the same reason why there's two columns in the weight matrix. One column is for this one, one column is for this one. Any other questions? Okay. So, so in the weight matrix, both were weight values um, for one, one column for each neuron in the network that you have shown. Mm -hmm. So where are the bias values? The bias values are here. So oh, I just two values. Okay. Yeah, so this the bias is a vector and the weight is a matrix. Sorry, I have to flash through this. One sec. There we go. Okay. Anything else? These are really good questions. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So just to emphasize, the number that I care about at the end of the day is the output from this neuron, so this 0.012. So that's the output from layer 1, neuron 1. And that means that's going to be what's going to go on this link here. So now if I go back to my full diagram, for this example we were looking at, we, we know what all these uh, outputs are in the first layer, because this is just our input. And then we just calculated this guy here. This is the 0.012. And we still have two unknown outputs from these two neurons. The one we ultimately want is the output from this final layer. But the information has to go from left to right. So before we can calculate this one, we need to get this one first. OK, so let's look at this node now. And I actually want you guys to try this yourself. Um, so this is why I wanted you to have paper. <laughs> so um, we're going to look at the same input, same weights and biases. I haven't changed anything from the previous slide over here. Um, and I want to remind you of the formula that you need to calculate this. And so these are the three things that I want you to calculate. Start again by calculating this sum, then add the bias, and then apply G. And just to give you a hint, I've highlighted what you need to be thinking about in order to do this calculation. So these are the columns. Anything that's not highlighted, you shouldn't need to use at all. And remember that when things are zero, it makes the calculation a lot easier. Okay, so maybe... Uh, work this out with the person next to you. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do this and put up your hand if you need help. I'm happy to come around and help.
Yeah, it's okay. It's good. <laughs> you should do the answer to like as a control. <laughs> like how long? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was worried. Okay, guys, if I can get your attention up here again. So I was really happy to see a lot of good discussion. Um, so uh, anyone want to tell me what they got as an answer? One half. How many people got one half? Anyone get something else? Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's the answer. So this is what <laughs> just checking, you know, you never know. <laughs> um, so this is what you should have got for each element here. You should have got 7.8, 0, and 0 0.5. And walking around, I saw a lot of you had the right answer, so that's awesome. Um, just one thing I want to emphasize now, just because someone asked about it. I, I mentioned that this structure is inspired by the brain. I, I just want to make it clear that I'm not saying that this is exactly what your brain does. <laughs> All I'm saying is that um, the ideas are inspired by that. So the fact that we have neurons and connections between them and we're sending signals, it's just an inspiration, but what goes on in your brain is much more sophisticated and people don't fully understand it yet. So I, I'm not trying to say that I'm telling you exactly how your brain works, just to make that clear. Okay, so let's just summarize what we have now. So now we have almost all of our outputs and we're ready to calculate the final output of this network based on this number you guys calculated and this 0 0.012 that we had. So let's now zoom, zoom in on this last layer. So for this last layer, 
i only have two inputs. so before i had nine. i had to consider nine inputs. now i only need to consider these two so my previous layer output, as i said, it was just zero point zero one two and zero point five now to do this, i need a new set of weights and biases. so there's actually weight and bias matrices and vectors on every single layer of this network. so i need new ones now and i use the same formula except now l is going to be equal to two and i is going to be equal to one and i do this calculation for the sum here i get minus one point eight when i add the bias i get two point one and then when i calculate g so i calculate g of two point one here i end up getting zero point eight nine in the end so this is the final output from my neural network the output from layer two neuron one is zero point eight nine so again, just to go back to our diagram that we're always thinking of, I put in an input of this three by three image and my output was 0 0.89. So what does that mean? What does it mean that I got an output of 0 0.89? Or maybe to ask that question in a different way, let's just go back to our goal. Our goal was to identify whether an image contains one rectangle. So what we wanted was to be able to feed in this image and get a one, but what we got was 0.89. So what do you think? It kind of relates back to when I asked you about this squirrel image before. What do you guys think this 8, 9 means? Yeah? Perfect. Yeah, exactly. It thinks there's a rectangle, but it's not completely sure. Maybe it's, I would say maybe it's 89% sure or something like that. Maybe I can phrase it in that way, right? That it's not completely sure, but it's pretty sure that there is one there. So that's actually pretty nice, right? It's giving us an idea of how confident it is that this rectangle is there. And that kind of tells us how well we're doing. So ideally, what we would like is we would like a network that could identify any possible input. So that means I would have the same weights and biases, but I could put many different inputs there. So ideally, what I would like to find uh, is a perfect network where if I were to feed in this image, I would get a one. If I feed in this one, I get a zero. But for all those different inputs, I would like to have the same weights and biases. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? OK. So as we've seen, it takes a little while to calculate what the output from our network is. So actually, what we usually do is we use code to do this. We wouldn't usually use a pen and paper. So actually, what I want to do now is I want to show you some really simple code to do what you guys just did by hand. So um, you have to go to this website here, and then you need to click this button. And I just want to warn you, when you click this button, it's going to take around a minute to load. So uh, just don't think it's not working. You just have to wait, and eventually something will pop up. But it's just a bit slow. So I hope this is going to work. Um, so I'll come around and just check that this is working. And it should actually work from your phone, too. Um, so maybe first just go to this website and click this button. We'll wait a minute or two because it does take a while to load and then we'll go from there. So just let me know if it's if you're concerned that it's not working or have questions. If you don't have a device with you, maybe just try to move next to someone who has one. And then in a minute or two, we'll start again once you all have this up. The V, so the V is, it's, so the, um, do you have a pen? I can. So. G of Z is one over one plus B to minus oh, Z, right? Yeah. So this oh, is so a, this is a function, right? In. And then what oh. we wanted was the G of this sum over J. Oh, you put that J. number. That yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. So this was okay. J I plus B, whatever it was I. So you have to put. This oh, you calculate okay. this and then you put it in a D. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And then just click that button there, and it's going to take like a little while to load. So just wait till this stops. This okay. one. It'll be about a minute or takes a while. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. So you just just wait. That's yeah. <coughs> yes, and then click here. Yeah. So guys, once you click that button, you're gonna see some spinning circles. That's exactly right. You just have to wait for about a minute, okay? So don't keep refreshing. 
you're going to like see some colorful circles spinning around. Perfect, yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. I got a feeling your chicken tower the first time. Oh, okay, so yeah, that looks exactly right. It'll load eventually. Have you guys got it? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, great. Oh, okay, I'm glad it's working. Okay. Did it not work? It's an L, not a 1. <laughs> guys, sorry uh, if this was confusing, but the uh, this should be an L. This is not a 1. This is like the first initial of my name. So this is L Hayward, not 1, in case that's giving you the wrong address. <laughs> okay, so I think a lot of you have it. So you wrote this? Yeah, I did, yeah. Okay, so I think a lot of you have it. Some of you still have the circles loading, the colorful circles telling you that you're loading, but I think I'll just start explaining. Um, and I think a lot of you have it, so if you don't, maybe you can just like look at someone down the row, and I think probably someone else is gonna have what you need to see. Okay, so <laughs> that's my dog, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so this is what you should load eventually. So how many people have this loaded? <coughs> okay, how many people have the colorful circles? Still loading? Okay, just a couple. So, perfect. So, let's maybe start. So, this code is divided into three different sections. Um, and so, if you look at the places that have code, these are the places where we want to execute. So, the first thing I want to show you is just how to run code in here. So, if you're on a laptop, you need to press Shift and then the Enter key. So, Shift, Enter, that's going to execute the output. If it's on your phone, there's just a play button. So, you just have to push that button. Anyone having troubles with that? Did, how many people got this output when they ran it? So how, can anyone got this output? Can you raise your hand if you were able to get this output? Okay, great, great, lots of people, okay. So let's just start by talking about this first section of code. So if you run that, what it's doing is it's specifying what you want your input to be. So this is our little three by three image that we have here. So remember that we said we want to specify that input in terms of a list of zeros and ones, and it should be nine, nine elements in this list. So in this case, my x input is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And then here, you, don't, you can look at this if you're familiar with code, but if you want, you can just ignore this whole section. What this is really just doing is printing the image. So if you, if you are really new to coding, I would really just look at this one line. I just want you to kind of understand this one line. And that's great for today. If you understand that, like how this image, this uh, line of code kind of corresponds to this image. So this is just kind of what your image looks like. Yeah, question. Yes. Yeah, so you need to have commas between each element of your input. Yeah, great question. Any other questions about this little part of the code? Okay, so let's go to the next part. The next part we want to specify our weights and biases for our network, okay? So here's our weights and biases. This is just exactly what I had on the slides before. So in here, I'm just specifying all of the elements. So the first weight matrix has nine rows and two columns, if you might remember. Then this is the, the bias for the first layer. Then the weights for the second layer and the biases. And if I execute this, I should again get output. So it's just going to print out what I have for those weights and biases. Questions? Anything? Any questions? Any troubles? Okay. So now the last thing we do is we calculate the output. So <clears throat> this is really the most exciting part, right? This is what we want to know is what this input gives us as output. So all that I'm doing here is I'm defining this sigmoid function, this g of x. So remember, it's 1 over 1 plus exponential of, of minus z. And then I'm just calculating this output. So this is just doing that linear algebra that I asked you guys to do. Now, you don't need to change this part of the code at all. So I'm happy to answer questions for those of you that are really interested in understanding exactly what this is doing. But um, Maybe if I, what I'm really hoping is you can look at this and you can just see it looks like what I showed you on the previous slide, right? You can see I'm multiplying x by some matrix w and then I'm adding a bias. So just this idea, I don't expect you to understand exactly how the code works if you might never have seen code before, but I hope the idea of this makes sense. 
And if I execute this, I should see, okay, the output of the last layer is 0 0.8869, blah, blah, blah. So that's 0 0.89. That's exactly what we calculated, right, for this image? Okay, so now I want to give you guys a bit of time to play around with this code. So I have some exercises that I suggest you try, but you can, you can play with it in whatever way you want, and I'm happy to help if something breaks or something doesn't work or you don't understand what's happening. Um, but here's just a few things you might want to try. So the first would be just putting in some different inputs. So try to put in the input corresponding to these three things and check what you get as output. And I can tell you what the answer is supposed to be if you're wondering. Um, the next thing you could try is try just changing the input to a lot of different things. And remember that when we get an, in, we, when we get an output, it's not usually going to be a 0 or 1. It's going to be somewhere in between. So, but usually we would say that we would calculate the output by rounding, right? So if we get 0.89, that's closer to 1, right? So it's doing pretty well. But maybe you can come up with a case where it would actually get the wrong thing, even after it rounds. So let's see if you can find an example like that. Um, and the last thing you might want to try, you could try going back to this first input that I gave you, and then you could try adjusting the weights and biases. You can see maybe you can actually get better than 0.89. Maybe you can adjust those weights and biases and you can get something better. And you can try that on lots of different inputs. See if you can get something that works better than what I gave you. OK, so I'll give you guys a few minutes, maybe even like 10 minutes to try this. Just play around, talk to people. OK, five minutes? OK. I think it, I only have like three slides after this. Do you think it's OK if you get it's, it's still 11.25, right? Oh, you know what? Yeah, yeah, that's right, because there's a question time built in. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of like absorbed yeah, 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 the question. Yeah, sorry, I got, well. I got next like, up, because yeah. we have yeah. a decent amount of question time. So, yeah, we're good. Because they've been asking a lot of questions. That's right. Is, is it okay? So, yeah, yeah. It, so since you're doing so interactively, I, I, sorry, actually, I just got mixed up. It's okay? Because okay. this is good. really just your question. Yeah. Okay. okay, but I do want to have time at the end for general questions, but I was thinking like five. You'll have five more questions. So I think it'll be fine if I do like five to seven for this. Yeah, I think you're fine. Okay, cool.
Okay, guys. Hi, guys. Sorry to interrupt. So, as I was walking around, it seems like a lot of you were asking some really good questions about this, and I think finding good answers to a lot of these questions. So, um, in case you're wondering, the answer to this first part, this is what you should have got when you put those inputs in. Um, for the second part, I think a lot of you found a lot of really good examples, cases where this, these weights and biases actually don't work. So I know one was if you put in just the completely black square, that should still be a rectangle, right? That's just a three by three rectangle, but it doesn't work. It, it tells you something very small. So that's just an example where this specific network I gave you doesn't work. Um, so in, in the last part of the exercise, I asked you to, you know, you could try tweaking those weights and biases yourself. But you can see that that's going to be very tedious, right? To just do that yourself, just randomly change them. So I hope you can appreciate we want a smarter way to do that, right? Like we don't, we don't want to be just sitting there randomly changing numbers. And we also want something that works for all possible inputs, right? So tweaking something and then checking many inputs, that's going to take a really long time. Um, so just to kind of say that maybe in more of a visual way, if we look back at this first example, we saw that if we put in this, this rectangle on the left, we got output 0.89. That's pretty good, but ideally we'd like it to be 1. So what we would like to do is choose the weights and biases such that the difference between yx and the true yx is as small as it possibly could be for all of the inputs, not just for 1. And the way that we actually do that is we introduce a cost function. So I'm calling that c. So C depends on my weights and biases. It's a function of my weights and biases in my network. And what I really do is I sum over all of my inputs, and I look at how different they are, what I get from my network versus what I'm supposed to get. And so just to see if this is clear, if I had a perfect network, something that always worked, always gave me the right thing, what would C be in that case? Zero, exactly. So if it, if it was a perfect classifier, C would be zero. In practice, we often have cases where we're trying to do something like this. We don't usually get all the way to C equals zero. But what we want to do is we want to get it as small as possible. So, so we, what we basically do is we have a way of modifying our weights and biases, and we try to do that in a way that this C decreases. So the way we actually do that is these formulas here. So this is where you're finally getting to C calculus. So, Basically, the way we modify these weights and biases, and I'm happy to talk about this in more detail if people kind of want to know where this comes from, but this is what we actually program our computer to do. We program it to calculate this derivative here, and then we have some number r, which is called a learning rate. This is a number that we have to choose. And basically, we want to adjust our weights and biases by looking at this formula. So we would, we would do one iteration of our of our neural network looking at data, and we would look at how bad is this cost function. And we would say, how could I modify my weights and biases so that this cost function gets a bit smaller? And doing this modification ideally should make it a little bit smaller, but it's not going to make it all the way to zero. So then we need to keep doing this. We see, okay, how can we make it a little bit smaller? And we keep taking steps and steps. And eventually, hopefully, we get to a case where this cost function is very small. Yeah? So Question? Determined learning rate, we are then calculating an optimal W and a B? Yeah, is that what we are doing? exactly. We're calculating an optimal W and B so that C is as small as possible. But how do we decide what, so that is our uh, choice, whatever R we choose to pick. Yes, R is a choice. This is, yeah. This is also something that maybe some R's work better than others. You might try, this is another reason why this procedure becomes very complicated and there's many levels, right? So we could choose different values of R. We could also choose different numbers of neurons, right, in our, in our layers, right? There's lots of things we could try doing that would be a slightly different network and some of them might work better than others. We don't always know beforehand what's going to work and better. What is the number between zero and one? Zero means no uh, learning? I think it actually, no, uh, yeah, zero would mean no learning, but I don't think it actually has to be between zero and one. I think it can be higher. I think usually people would probably have it between zero and one. But I don't know if there's actually any reason why it couldn't be bigger. So yeah. conceptually, is the learning rate a step size? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yep, yep, perfect. Any other questions about that? 
so i promised you guys you were going to see some calculus. so i i know i didn't describe it in a lot of detail, but i hope now you kind of appreciate that in order to understand how these neural networks work, we do need both linear algebra and calculus. so last thing i wanted to say is what about physics? so all i've really shown you today is pictures of rectangles and some pictures of birds and and dogs. Um, but actually, you're going to hear a lot of talks in the afternoon that talk about specific applications in physics, but I hope from what you've seen today, it's not so hard to believe that we could use this in physics, because lots of the inputs you'll see in physics are actually just images, right? I might take some experimental data, yeah, astronomy, something in astronomy. A lot of the data I'm going to collect, I could be thinking of it as an image. This is just one example. This is some data from physics that I took from a paper. You could definitely believe that you could translate this into a series of ones and zeros, right? And then you could do something similar, maybe a different network, maybe a different number of layers, a different number of neurons, a different learning rate. You could vary a lot of things, but the ideas would be the same as what I presented you today. Okay, so this is my last slide. Um, I hope that today you kind of understood what this picture means. It really just means multiplying matrices, right? It's really just a visual way of thinking of linear algebra. Um, so I hope that the idea of how you take input to, into one of these networks and calculate output is clear. Um, I'm happy for you to keep using that code that I gave you, however you might want to, in your classes or something like that. Um, and if you want to look at more examples, um, here's a really great website that has a lot of tutorials that are a little bit more advanced. And these are going to show you um, how you actually could train these networks, so how you could actually implement this calculus that I was showing you on the previous slides, a few slides back. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, and you can contact me by email from the, my emails on this form that you got if you have any questions about how you might use this in your classroom. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Lauren, for a great talk. Um, I think we have time maybe for one or Two uh, questions, if they're really quick. So um, that was really fun. Um, Thank you. Is there a, like um, a way that you would be able to look at a problem and say this problem is going to give me a cost function or, or weights and, and biases that are going to be closer to zero? For example, when you had the, only the nine pixels, you can you can actually put every possible configuration in there and train it that way. Mm -hmm. So is that the kind of situation? If you can designate all the possible solutions, does that give you a much better cost function? Not necessarily. Actually, this is something people are working on this a lot, trying to understand how, how do we really figure out when we can get the best answer. And in some cases, maybe it's really hard to do. So what actually happens a lot of the time is that our algorithm gets stuck. So, you know, we're trying to minimize this function. But you could imagine you have a function that has lots of minima, right? Maybe it has one minima that's biggest, but it has something that's a bit smaller. Lots of the time, it actually gets stuck. So even in this simple example, you're right. I, maybe I, I know I could figure out what the exact answer is supposed to be, because in the example I was showing you, I can actually calculate all of the possible inputs. Um, but still, if I were to use this method, it could actually get stuck. So then you have to be really careful with this when you go to more complicated examples. And there are lots of cases where you're actually not finding the real minimum, you're finding something else that looks kind of looks like a minimum, but it's not the true minimum. Yeah. No, it actually looks a lot like a feedback mechanism, right? So mm -hmm. you've got, and so um, actually that would be the next question. Does the does the rate of learning change in your in your progression? That's a great. That's a really great question. So um, actually, in what I showed you, I just wrote R as learning rate, and but usually that's something that people often do. They'll start because it's kind of a step size, right? And so usually people often people will start with this being something big, and as it finds the solution, it'll make it smaller. Because as I get closer, I just want to take smaller steps. That's a great question. Yeah. But it's not clear. Step size in what? Oh. Can you say something more about the step size? Step size of what? Yeah. So it's really just saying how how much I want to change this weight, right? That's maybe the simplest way to see it. That I'm, I'm starting from what I had before, and I'm making a small change. And if I make R bigger, it's going to be a bigger change. Yeah. OK, one more question. If I was to take this back to school, and I'm having my students start with a rectangle, which is the beginning, what would be the next thing 
the because they would, they would get tired looking at rectangles. So. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, awesome question. Yeah, so I like this rectangle example only because there's only nine inputs, right? So you can easily draw this. You can actually make this diagram that I kept showing you where this is actually nine, right? But you can imagine if I'm looking at bigger input, I'm not going to actually want to draw so many lines, right? Um, so an, an example that people often start with is an example of looking at handwritten digits. So it's called MNIST is the data set. Um, so what someone did is they got a bunch of students to write out numbers, zero through nine, right? You write by hand what they are. So that becomes an image, right? An image of a digit written. And then you try to train a network. It's going to have 10 outputs in that case. And you, it, those outputs are going to be what number was actually written in that image. So I think that's a really great one. If you go to this um, website, I think they probably have a tutorial where they discuss that. And I think that's a really good example to look at next. And then you can also start looking at some examples from physics. And I could talk to you about some simple ones for that case too, maybe if you want. Great. I think that's all the time we have for questions right now. But Lauren will be around at, the, at lunch as well. So let's thank her again. Thanks, Lauren. One other comment is if you would like to talk about modifying that example code that Lauren made, and she maybe will do this too, to be trainable and have the training part put, and we could talk about adding that to later if you want to contact us about that.